Doctor. Hi, good morning and a very warm welcome to the first webinar of our newly launched customer learning program, Winning Together. It's an absolute pleasure to see so many of you here today. You guys have very palpably manifested a terrific zeal and a passion for learning. Winning Together is indeed learning together. And learning together is the best survival strategy to win in the marketplace. Today's webinar is titled LED Learn to Differentiate and your presenter for today is Mr. M. V. Roy from Philips Lumileds. Mr. Roy is an acknowledged expert in LEDs in the industry. Let me thank you once again for teaming up with us to win and hand over the microphone for a very engaging session to Mr. M. V. Roy. All yours, M. V. Thank you. Thank you, Shomo. And uh, thank you for the introduction. And thanks a lot for all the participants. Um, I see a, um, a good a mix of participants. So I'll try my best to make this uh, one hour, one hour uh, very useful to the participants. So I would like to start. Okay, so the agenda for today is a quick introduction about the LED as a semiconductor, its characteristics, uh, the advantages of LED, which are very familiar to all of us, and the differentiators or the special features of the LED, which help us to win and provide superior customer experience. So some of these key factors are a hot testing, hot targeting, freedom from binning, free from wire bond, crisp white, lime, PC umber. And last, but the most important topic, lumen maintenance, which is about how the LED, the light source behaves over a period of time. The industry uses uh, various um, terms to like L0, L1, L2, etc., to denote the different levels of integration or packaging of the LED luminaire. So L0 is the heart of the LED, the semiconductor PN junction, so which can be packaged into a discrete LED or a multi-die array. And L1 um, denotes the packaged LED which has the required uh, primary optics, which is the option to extract the option to extract the heat out of the die and the option for electrical connection connections. And L2 is the LED array. So it has multiple LEDs on a base, uh, which is MCPCB or a similar material. And L3, which is a light, which is the light engine. Uh, it's, it's a module which includes LED or LED array with the required secondary optics, heatsink for thermal management and the driver. And L4 is the complete fixture, so which has additional features over the light engine to meet the industrial uh, application requirements, like options for mounting, necessary protections depending on the area of operation, like um, whether it's outdoor or indoor, what's the level of uh, ingress protection required, etc. Uh, back to the basics. We all know that LED stands for light emitting diode. And diode is a semiconductor device with PN junction and emits visible light in the range of 400 to 700 nanometer when electric current is passed through it. 
the electric current starts flowing through the LED when it is forward biased, which causes the electrons and holes to combine to release the visible light. So as you can see in this band, um, emissions lower than this range, that is lower than 400 nanometer, spreads to ultraviolet, X-rays, etc., and higher than 700 nanometer spreads to infrared, and uh, higher than that is the radio frequency. And um, both UV and IR is a, is, a, is considered as a disadvantage um, in the lighting application, as they don't contribute to the useful light thereby reducing the efficacy of the light source and sometimes deteriorating the characteristic of the surface uh, it falls like fading or discomfort or damage to the skin etc so we'll see how the radiation is limited to the visible range we'll see it in the coming in the following slides so here i, I have a picture which shows the forward biased pn junction and uh, it emits uh, visible light. And the image to the bottom, to the bottom of the screen shows the actual photo of uh, um, EN junction, showing the quantum well, which is the active region where the recombination of electrons and holes happens. Okay, so the PN10 type semiconductor, um, these regions are created by controlling the doping levels. The difference in the doping level creates a barrier, which is called the band gap energy, EG. Now, when, when this PN junction is forward biased, and the current flows, the radiation, the emitted radiation, um, the wavelength of the emitted radiation follows the Planck's equation, so which, which implies that the, the frequency of radiation is, is dependent on the energy difference. So here I have the diode characteristics of the LED. Uh, there is a common um, question uh, which, uh, which comes up, that is what happens when the LED is uh, reverse biased, when you apply a reverse voltage to the LED. So this shows the complete characteristic of the LED and the diode. It has a turn on voltage. So it has a turn on voltage V on, which you can see on this uh, graph. So this turn on voltage V on is defined by the energy difference of the two uh, type of uh, P and N uh, materials. So once the applied voltage exceeds this V on, then the forward current starts to flow and the diode is, or the LED is forward biased. And once it starts conducting, you can see that the Forward current is limited by a series resistance, which is dynamic, which is defined uh, in the graph as uh, one by slope, RS. And if the LED is reverse biased, applied with a negative voltage, a satur reverse saturation current flows, which is in the range of picoamps to nanoamps. And if the voltage is exceeded to the uh, breakdown voltage region, then the LED, the junction breaks down, which is not a reversible, which is not reversible. Um, 
Um, one more key uh, point to add here is um, LEDs. The best way to drive uh, an LED is driving the LED in series, connecting the LEDs, multiple LEDs in series. Because as you can see here, um, the the on resistance of the LED is dynamic, and uh, it uh, a slight change in voltage can cause a high difference in the current. So this is this is the reason why the, it's always best to drive the LED in uh, in series series mode, all multiple LEDs in series mode, so that uh, the current the uniform current flows through all the all the LEDs. So we have seen that the current flowing through the LED releases uh, photons, which is the visible light, and and the losses is dissipated as heat. So the light produced by the LED, the radiation produced by the LED is dependent on the the drive current IF and and the temperature. We will see this relation, uh, more details of this relation in the coming slides. Okay, first let's see the relation of the drive current versus the light output of the LED. So this this is what um, is the ideal condition. As the current drive current increases, the light output um, increases proportionately. But this doesn't happen. As the current increases, the losses um, associated losses also increase because of the the current density through the die. So practically, what we see is this, and and this difference is called a droop. So this droop varies from LED to LED, depend on the, depending on the architecture. So next is the effect of heat on the light output. Okay. So as the as the temperature increases, so as we have seen in the previous slide, uh, the drive current um, the produces light, but there are losses, and those losses is dissipated as heat, and this heat uh, again um, heats up the junction, which causes the light to drop. So this is this curve shows how the uh, light drops when the temperature of the junction increases. And this drop is termed as a uh, hot cold factor. So this is the difference between the light output at 85 degree versus uh, 25 degree. Okay, this shows the relation between the input current and the light output, and also the factors, input voltage, the power, that's the input power to the LED, and, and their interconnection. So we already saw the effect of current and temperature. Now, uh, the increased temperature also reduces the VF, the voltage across the LED, which again reduces uh, the power. So um, there is an online calculator which helps to do the system calculation. So which factors the drive current, the temperature uh, of the junction, and also uh, considers the the driver losses, the thermal characteristics of the heat sink use, and the optical losses to give a complete uh, system performance. So we saw that um, the frequency of the light output, uh, the frequency of the radiated um, 
radiation from the LED is dependent on the energy difference, the band gap energy. So now, how is this controlled to get the required light output? So it depends on the materials materials uh, used. So um, for yellow to red color wavelength range, that is 585 nanometer to 645 nanometer, Allen gap is the material used, uh, which is aluminum, aluminum, indium, gallium, and phosphide. So this material gives um, yellow to red uh, LED color. And in GAN, indium, gallium, and nitride, it's used to create light in the wavelength range 440 nanometer to 550 nanometer, which is blue, uh, blue to green. Here I have uh, the spectrum of various color LEDs like uh, red, amber, green, cyan, blue, and royal blue. So this shows the relative intensity of radiation for each, uh, each of the wavelength uh, range, wavelength spectrum. This is the CIE 1931 uh, chromaticity diagram, uh, which is used to represent the colors, visible colors. So, as we have seen, the INGAN is used to create um, green to blue color range, and the Allen gap material is used to create uh, amber, uh, yellow to red color LEDs. So now um, the question is how is how is white white LED produced? So white white light can be created by mixing different colors, for example, red, green, and blue, uh, as is uh, shown on the left side. So the the RGB combination <clears throat> creates the white light. But this method is slightly complex uh, as it requires multiple LEDs and then um, multiple LEDs and then it, it requires a control control uh, control system to um, indep independently control the currents through each of these LEDs to achieve achieve the required color, which is white. And in the second option, it is uh, the, the base base is a blue LED, and on top of that, there is a phosphor a phosphor layer, which converts part of the blue uh, blue em uh, emission into yellow light, and the combination which gives a white light. Okay, now talking about white light, white light has different shades. So here I have, I have you can see the bar, which ranges from 1000K uh, to 10,000K. So what is this, what are these numbers? This is the CCT and or the correlated color temperature in degree Kelvin. The correlation between the temperature of, uh, the temperature of a black body at that temperature to the light emitted by that black body. So that's how these uh, numbers are uh, marked. So this can be understood by the example of a filament bulb. So this produces, filament bulb produces a white, uh, produces light by heating up the filament. So when the voltage is low, the current is low, 
and so is the temperature of the filament and and it produces a reddish light uh, say around 2700 k temperature and as you increase the voltage the current increases and the temperature increases so cha changing the color to neutral and then to clue, uh, into cool white or the bluish light so let's take the example uh, the first case of um, of uh, creating white light by mixing three uh, three color in so here you can see the red uh, the three color points marked red green and uh, and blue so what's the resultant so the resultant is the vector sum of all the three um, and you can see that it falls on the black body uh, locus black body line so black body locus is the is the same as the bar uh, you, you see on the right side which is the uh, black body is the white uh, the shades of uh, white color now the second option of uh, second way of creating white light is you have uh, you have a blue led and then yellow phosphor so the the resultant uh, radiation is both blue light and the yellow light so the amount of phosphor uh, deposited or the thickness of the phosphor deposited on the blue chip defines the amount of uh, yellow light produced so by varying the thickness the content of yellow uh, can be uh, uh, adjusted so that defines where the resultant falls i have shown this white region uh, which is the range of white light that can be produced by this method now how about the warm white warm colors so the red phosphor is added so which converts uh, part of the blue light to uh, red red output red light so by this way we can create uh, the warm colors also warm colors of white also So this slide um, shows the structure of uh, L1, which is the packaged LED. As you can see, there is a ceramic uh, substrate. So this helps. Uh, this is a carrier which provides electrical insulation to the chip and um, helps to take away the heat from the chip. The electrical pad uh, for soldering uh, soldering the LED onto the a PCB for uh, for electrical connection that's also attached to this ceramic base, and you can see the phosphor uh, the phosphor coating the yellow coating on top of the chip, and and the silicon and the primary silicon lens, uh, which protects the chip, and also it helps extract maximum amount of light uh, maximum light from the chip. Um, so we all know that LED uh, has a lot of benefits like uh, long life, higher efficacy, the rug ruggedness. It's a directional source, and there are no hazardous materials used. But what are the differential uh, LED benefits? So these are I would like to uh, highlight the quality of light, with LEDs. It's possible to um, possible to have different uh, combination of cct cri uh, depending on the application so for example for an outdoor uh, street lighting application you don't need a very high cri or r9 content but it, it these factors are important for indoor uh, lighting or um, or for a retail retail lighting application the next is freedom from binning uh, we'll talk, we'll talk about these in the in the coming slides so uh, <clears throat> the next is the packaging flexibility the leds are uh, the led packages are becoming so small now 1.6 uh, as small as 1.6 mm by 1 mm which gives the designers the flexibility to uh, arrange the leds in in a, in a, in a pattern and a uh, profile uh, to meet different application requirements like architectural lighting
Okay, so so when we talked about talk about the differential advantage of the LED, I would like to start with the hot testing. Traditionally, the LEDs were uh, were tested and bent at twenty five degree. Uh, following the semiconductor uh, semiconductor industry, but this is um, this is not um, suitable for LED because in the application the LED is always runs hot. It's nowhere. Uh, it's never close to uh, 25 degree. So that's the reason um, where the hot testing is really useful. So um, the new Luxian LEDs are tested and bent at Typical operating condition, which is 85, 85 degrees. Sorry. So, <clears throat> so what's what's the importance of uh, hot testing? So one thing, what we have, one parameter, what we have seen is the light changes, uh, the light output changes uh, depending on the temperature, and the other uh, other parameter which changes with temperature is the is the color, is the color point. Okay, so this is the graph we have seen how the light output changes with respect to uh, with respect to the temperature. And also, the voltage, the voltage of the LED uh, changes with temp temperature, that voltage reduces with temperature. So this affects the efficacy, efficacy of the LED. So this, is, this graph shows uh, the change of efficacy with respect to the uh, temperature. So this, uh, this, takes, uh, this shows two factors. One is the light output and the voltage change. And the third is, is the the color point. So if you look at look at the uh, yellow dots, so this shows the color points of LED, uh, various LEDs at 25 degree. And as the temperature temperature increases, the color point shifts. So if the LEDs were to be tested at 25 degree, then the design, the lighting designer has to, uh, the luminaire designer has to do the calculation to extrapolate the light output from 25 degree uh, data, which is available in the data sheet, to the 85 degree data. 85 degree uh, actual uh, output. The efficacy calculation, the durating curve, the color calculation, so everything uh, is, is a uh, is a lot of work uh, for the for the lighting uh, luminaire designer. So with with the hot testing. Uh, it uh, it enables simple designs, lower design uh, design cost, and better confidence, better predictability of how the luminaire is going to behave uh, in the in the actual application. Okay. So next next is uh, about hot targeting, so which is which is uh, which is possible for uh, the mid power the plastic package LEDs. So the chart um, uh, you see now is the ANSI bin structure, and each for each nominal uh, color, the the size of the bin is um, seven step macadam. Okay, so this is a zoomed uh, um, bin structure for 2,700 uh, Kelvin. So the, all the six bins, all the six bins put together, the, the larger blue quadrangle uh, is of seven step uh, tolerance seven step macadam which means that if uh, if you take two leds uh, one at the opposite uh, one on each corner of the of this uh, quadrangle so then it's it's possible that you, you know, the the viewer may see a difference in color so 
So that's when the, the this new binning structure uh, helps. So this is this is a completely different uh, completely different binning structure, which with you can see the circles. The inner circle, the inner brown circle, is um, is a three-step tolerance, and the next blue circle is the five-step tolerance circle, and the the larger uh, blue quadrangle is a seven-step. So this gives um, this gives the flexibility to the to the designer to choose the bins of the LED depending on the application. So this this binning structure is called one one, one by nine uh, micro binning, and it is hot targeted, which means the color point which you see in the data sheet or the color point at which the LEDs are binned and available are hot targeted to 65 or 85 degrees. So this again, these color points are the are the actual colors you will see in application. Okay, so uh, freedom from binning. So in the previous slides, we saw ANSI bin and the sub bins. So this gives uh, this puts a little limitation on uh, uh, LED uh, based products. So when you uh, like when 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 you have to buy a CFL, you just say neutral. I mean uh, five thousand K or four thousand K, and it's always the same color. But in case of LED, you saw the bins. So bins from one LED may look different from the bin from other LED, uh, or it has to be mixed. Or the other option is freedom uh, LED with the freedom from binning option. So we have seen the structure of the LED. So the blue LED chip and the phosphor on top to create the white uh, white light. Now, depending uh, because of the slight to uh, variations in the uh, process uh, like for example if you uh, the reactor where the pn junction the pn junction is created it operates at very high uh, it's done at very high temperature uh, close to 800 degrees and even a change of half a degree creates a uh, shift in the color output so how is this how can this be addressed So I have shown here the ANSI bin again, and I'm zooming on uh, 4000K uh, ANSI bin structure. Okay, now to create this 4000K uh, light, so we have the blue LED. So uh, if uh, consider you have three, uh, we have three blue LEDs. Which is the basis uh, basic uh, basis of the um, white LED, and uh, they have, as I've shown in this uh, slide, they are different in color, slightly different in the shape. That is depending on the the frequency emitted by each of these LEDs. So they, these these all three are blue LEDs, but slightly different in color. So now the yellow yellow um, rectangles you see on top are the phosphor plates. So this again have a different uh, different shade depending on the the thickness so if the blue leds can be characterized how is, what is the wavelength and then this uh, phosphor thickness is uh, known then a right mixing and matching can result in absolute uniform uh, white color from all of these leds like this so this uh, this technology uh, gives the advantage of uh, uh, advantage of uh, moving away from the bins, gives absolute uh, freedom from binning. So it's um, so the LED color is defined as 2,700K or 3,000K um, or the nominal whatever temperature, and the tolerance of three step or five step.
Okay, so as we discussed about the advancements in the technology, um, I would like to represent that in how the binning structure has changed over the period of time. So in 2008, the, the binning, the color binning structure was proprietary to each LED manufacturer, and uh, those were uh, wider than uh, wider than the ANSI seven-step uh, uh, definitions. And in 2009, these bins were all standardized to uh, ANSI, ANSI binning structure. And further, there were uh, micro binning introduced in uh, later in 2010. And in 2011, the freedom from binning, uh, the definition of LED color based on the color point and, and the tolerance was introduced. So um, LEDs are available with five-step macadam or three-step macadam or even in uh, one-step macadam tolerance, depending on the application requirement. So I have a uh, image application image shown on the top top of the top of the page, uh, which is which is a wall washer wall washing application, where uh, you can visualize how important it is uh, to have the uniform uh, same color uh, across uh, all the luminaires. Okay, we, we talked about uh, three-step macadam and five-step macadam tolerance. So a little uh, um, detail of what what exactly this means. So three-step macadam or three SDCM is uh, de defined uh, is um, considered as just noticeably different in color. So if you have uh, two LEDs which or two color light sources which have colors within uh, three-step macadam tolerance, it's it's very difficult to uh, perceive the color difference. Okay, so here I have a real uh, application where um, the color uniformity from LED to LED is very, very important. So the the wall wash on top of the top of the scene is lit with uh, Luxian A, uh, which is of three-step macadam tolerance, and uh, the mannequins are lit from the left, starting from the left. It is lit by a 22 watt CDM, the first mannequin, and the second and third are lit by LED, which is 19 watt Luxian S, and the last one is a the last mannequin is lit with a 75 watt halogen. So as we discussed about the, the flexibility in using uh, flexibility um, using LEDs, because of their small source uh, size, it's possible to create the entire 18 watt or more in, in a single, uh, single, as a single source, which enables a smaller reflector design and a, sh a sharp, um, sharp shadows and a, a punch, a, a good punch to the product to be displayed. Okay, so talking about um, wire bonds. So the wire bonds is, is a weak link in the uh, in the LED. Uh, the reason being um, because of uh, electrical overstress. There's a possibility of uh, this the wire bond breaking, or due to the temperature uh, cycling, it can cause uh, weakening of the uh, wire bond. So uh, this technology, uh, TFFC, that is thin film uh, flip chip technology which helps overcome this um, or avoid the wire bonds in the LED. So I have here the structure of the LED. I'll quickly go through this. Okay, so the, the ceramic package is the carrier on which 
the blue color, the, the chip is uh, mounted, and you can see the electrical uh, metallization layer for uh, for the contacts. And you can see the all the um, all the electrical connections are uh, achieved without the wire bonds. So, um, so we discussed about um, the wire bond. So the absence of wire bond gives uh, the makes this chip more reliable. And another advantage is you can see the top top surface of the LED is available available for uh, phosphor phosphor coating without any obstructions. So this means a different a different methods of uh, phosphor coating, be it uh, conformal coating or um, a phosphor plate, so multiple options are possible, which gives the flexibility to uh, mix and match the phosphor thickness and the the blue blue light, as we saw in the earlier slide, to achieve uh, freedom from binning. So that's that's an uh, added advantage of the thin film flip chip technology. Um, in added to that. It also helps uh, certain other advantages like um, lower thermal resistance, which means in your application it's it's easier to take out uh, take out the heat from from the LED chip and letting the LED run cooler, and better um, optical efficiency because the wire bond or the mounting of the wire bond is not obstructing the path of light, and electrical efficiency and uh, the current uh, spreading, etc. Also, from the optical uh, optical designer's point of view, uh, there is an advantage of this technology that is um, TFFC gives more directional light, whereas non-TFFC gives uh, a little uh, light spread towards the sides. Also, as you can see uh, in the in the in the picture here, so an uh, optical designer or a lens designer would love uh, the light source to be a point source, which gives which enables the optic designer to uh, design smaller optics and better uh, better defined optics. So this is an added advantage of uh, the thin film flip chip. Okay, so now I would like to talk about uh, the crisp white technology. In retail light, the lighting quality, uh, the quality of light was always uh, been a very important factor in the choice of the lighting system. So the retailers recognize uh, the important role uh, the good uh, the good lighting can play in uh, in directing customers into their stores, and uh, they are very much aware of the choices they can make. For a light source with a particular color temperature and color rendering. Um, but the warm light appearance is is desired for uh, colors with high R9 and uh, high CRI. But there is still a preference uh, for white to be undeniably white and not off white, or the creamy or yellowish appearance. So ideally, it would be best to have a combination of both uh, the highest color uh, rendering, which brings out the the brilliance of the colors of the of the product displayed, and also uh, the white, uh, the the bright white um, feel of the white um, garments or the products displayed to stand out.
So this is uh, this is the most desired option, a two-in-one option where all colors are bright and the white is a bright white, not not an off-white or uh, yellowish white. So this is possible with uh, crisp white uh, technology. So here I have the spectrum of uh, crisp white LED on on the, on the left side, and uh, and I have the color point and the tolerances for various light sources. Uh, that is, one is this um, crisp white, which you can see uh, is the is the dot here. And and the quadrilateral quadrangle is is the conventional CDM. So if you compare these two, um, you can see that um, if you compare uh, the the spectrum on the left side to the normal LED spectrum, general LED spectrum, what you will see is there are two peaks in the in the blue region which you can see here. So this, this the second peak, which is at 410 nanometer, uh, which is which is creating the effect of um, bright um, white appearance of the white uh, white objects. So which we will talk about in, in, in the coming slides. And as you can see, the color point is slightly below the black black body locus. So which is which is similar to the CDM CDM light source. So here I have a sample pictures taken with the crisp white and the standard uh, standard LED. So here you can see the, the the how the white looks. And the next is um, comparison of crisp white with the traditional CDM. The traditional CDM the red looks slightly orange orangish red, whereas the crisp white it looks uh, rich rich red in color. And this slide is the comparison with the traditional halogen. So you can see how um, I'm not sure how um, how how good you can see the these images on your screen, but the red is looking uh, richer and the blue is uh, looking uh, richer in this uh, under the crisp white light. Okay, so as lighting uh, the designers or and um, architects, so you'll be uh, there is always a question: How does it compare with with the standard CDM or um, the uh, standard C, uh, COB or standard LED in terms of its various uh, parameters? So as you can see, the I would like to highlight on the typical CRI. Which is 91 for CDM and uh, same 91 for uh, the crisp white, whereas for a standard uh, COB it can be uh, as high as 97. Which this is the COB which we have used in, in the previous comparison slide, and the R9 value of CDM is uh, 39 versus 55 in case of crisp white, and it's high uh, of 89 for a stand, uh, standard COB or a standard LED. And all, um, both the CDM and the crisp white are the color point is below the black body locus. So, um, and you can see the the spectrum of the standard LED, which has single peak, and the crisp white has double peak, and also the CDM. Okay, so so to to, sum, to summarize, you ha you are getting a higher uh, lumen per watt efficacy of 92 lumen per watt against 62 lumen per watt of cerium, but um, and 
the CRI and R9 are similar or better, and in actual application, the the perceived the color colors are perceived much more brighter, and the white is perceived as white. Okay, I would like now to move to uh, two color LEDs. I would like to focus on the lime and the PC amber. So uh, why I would like to focus on these two colors is it gives a lot of flexibility um, in terms of color tuning application where you want to create a white light, various shades of white light from the same from the same luminaire. So in this chart, you can see the location of, uh, the, of lime and the PC amber, the, the lime, the uh, yellowish green lime. So consider an application where uh, a 3000 a color tuning application. And um, here in this diagram, uh, I've represented a, how a 3000K is created with um, a white LED a lime LED and a red LED. So the key uh, the key advantages of using the the lime is it's highly uh, it's high it's high efficacy and the second is the green LED is coming closer to the the resultant or to the black body and uh, which enables to use a lower um, output or uh, less number of red LEDs. So the advantage is that red LEDs are not that efficient. So overall, the system um, high lumen per watt is the resultant of using this combination. Okay, coming to the, the, the last topic, which is the most uh, most important uh, topic, which is, which is the lumen maintenance. So we talked about the light output, how it is affected by the temperature and the drive currents and the color points. But now the, the question is, how is this LED going to perform or how is the light going to perform um, over, over a period of time? So this this performance over time uh, can be uh, can be related to uh, the performance uh, the LMAT test test data. So um, so what is uh, what is lumen maintenance? So lumen maintenance uh, we know that LED LEDs have uh, very long light uh, very long life, and the what happens over a period of time unlike uh, the filament bulbs are uh, it, it doesn't uh, fail uh, it doesn't fail but the failure mode is the light output gradually uh, reducing over a period of time so this is represented as um, l70 i i, I uh, this is the familiar terms in the in the lighting L70, L50. So this means, um, for example, L70 means time to 70% lumen maintenance, and L50 means time to 50% lumen maintenance. The time it takes to uh, the, for the light output to reduce uh, reduces to the 50% or 70% power. Okay, so the LEDs, uh, the, how the LED behaves over a period of time. So the, we have this LMAT testing, uh, the, which the LED manufacturers do to, uh, to uh, see, the, see how the LED performs over a period of time. And uh, this, this data is available uh, to, uh, to decide what should be the operating current and temperature of the LED in the application. So here I have the, um, so based, based on the LMAT test data, so it's not possible to do the uh, test the LED for 
uh, $50,000 before releasing the LED into the market for the application. So, so what is done is, the, as per the LMAT, uh, a, a test is done for $6,000 minimum, and the extra the the curve, the behavior, the trend of the uh, lumen, uh, the performance of the LED is extrapolated. So this formula, what I've uh, shown here, is a formula used for extrapolation. So this graph shows the actual uh, light uh, output measure during the LMAT testing for the 7,000 hours. So you can see the, the graphs bloated. Uh, so this is for For three different um, three different temperatures, and you can see the red dots here, which indicates the energy star uh, energy star limit threshold for defining six uh, defining six twenty five thousand or thirty five thousand hours. So the previous slide we saw. 7,000 hours of data, and this slide you can see the extrapolation. So the the um, the trend the trend of the lumen depreciation is extrapolated, so that uh, um, the the performance over a longer period of time can be predicted. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at um, what exactly is the details of uh, the LM80. And the scope of the LMAT. So it's a it's a lumen maintenance test method uh, written by Illumination Engineering Society of uh, North America. So it it applies to LED package, uh, LED array or module uh, driven by an auxiliary driver. So it's not uh, it's not applicable for uh, module with integrated driver. And the LEDs are driven with external current sources, calibrated current sources during the during the test uh, test uh, stage, and the temperature uh, the temperature of the test setup the case temperature it is controlled uh, active um, actively controlled during the test uh, test duration, and the LEDs are stressed that uh, different temperatures and current, but uh, for example. 55 degree, 85 degree, and 105 degree. But the measurement of the uh, the measurement is temperatures, three case temperatures. So the test has to be conducted at 55, 85, and the third temperature is is um optional for the LED manufacturer to choose. And in addition to the case temperature, the ambient, the ambient temperature has to be main, maintained within a five degree uh, tolerance. And the relative humidity has to be less than uh, six, uh, less than 65%. Uh, and, uh, and the most importantly, the minimum duration of tests uh, required is 6,000 hours, and the measurement is done for every 1,000 hours. So if you look at the LED um, LMAT report of an LED, so you will see the test data for every every thousand dollars. Um, so the parameters like the light output, the the color point, and uh, the voltage. So all these are monitored every thousand hours and and, and uh, reported in the report. And LMAT also specifies the format of uh, uh, reporting the data. And LMAT does not specify any pass or fail criteria, and how the results have to be represented in a graph, uh, or or the curve fitting methods, the sample size, but and how many drive currents, and also. Um, same LED family can have different uh, CCT or different CCT or uh, what change calls for uh, retesting. 
So, so when when it when it says that LMAJ does not specify the how many drive currents and the third temperature is also not specified. So, um, luminaire when the LED drive current or the drive parameters are defined. So. The design is done for keeping in mind a, a performance L70 or uh, 36,000 hours or uh, or 50,000 hours. So the ch the choice of the drive current of the LED and um, the temperature, uh, the limit that the limiting temperature of the solder point of the LED should be uh, based on. Uh, it has to be based on the LMAT test report. So, for example, if you have um, the LMAT test uh, data, which says that 700 milliamps and uh, 85 degree junction, 85 degree solder point, uh, the extrapolated life is um, 50,000 hours, then it means that if you require uh, 50,000 hours of operation for the luminaire, I mean, from the LED point of view, then this should be, this will be the limiting, uh, limiting parameters. Okay. So this site talks about the energy star, um, EPA uh, reporting requirements, which I would like to skip. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, we, we we saw how the LMAT. Uh, the testing is done and how the data is extrapolated. So now um, what is important is um, that based on the IESNA uh, TM31 technical memorandum, it specifies how, uh, how the lumen maintenance data is extrapolated beyond the test time. So for example, if you have uh, tested the LED for um, 6,000 hours, how, how it can be extrapolated. So the key, the key thing is it gives a, a common playing field, so uniformity to the, to the way the, the data, the lumen maintenance is extrapolated. So some key key points I would like to highlight and uh, from TM21 is um, how how the data is used for extrapolation. So as we have seen, a minimum test duration of six thousand hours hours is required, and once completed six thousand hours of testing. The data points are used. Data points used for calculation is from thousand to six thousand hours, and if uh, once the test duration crosses or reaches ten thousand hours, the last five thousand hours of uh, test data is used for the lumen maintenance extrapolation, and for the last ten thousand hours, uh, and if the test is done for more than ten thousand hours, um, last fifty percent of the total measurement is used for extrapolating the. Uh, extrapolating the life, L70. Um, so this is this is the uh, ex expression used for uh, extrapolating the extrapolating the test data. <clears throat> Okay, so now we have seen the quality of light um, <clears throat> and the lumen maintenance, and we saw about the the, the reliability uh, aspect because of the uh, the thin film, the technological advan uh, advantage of thin film flip chip. But 
uh, this doesn't define the whole story. Because in a, in a system, you have various components starting from driver, the connections, LEDs, and the secondary optics, the lens, um, the thermal, uh, thermal management, and the mechanical aspect. So all these um, contribute to the, the system reliability. It's, so the system, uh, system reliability is not equal to LED reliability. So this is, this is one, uh, one, fa uh, one uh, key point uh, I, I would like to stress here, that each of these components are important to define the, the system reliability. Okay, so um, <clears throat> with this, I've come to the end of the presentation. So uh, thank you for listening. And thank you, MV, for this wonderful session. I'm sure all you guys found it of interest and value. We will earnestly look forward to having you again. Details of our upcoming webinars and the speakers will be put up in our website. Do click, do check on the URL you've just seen on, a, on your screens, not just for information on future webinars, but for our other programs and events as well. Try out the self-learning e-modules hosted on our website. They've been prepared with care just for you. We will, of course, mail our next webinar details and invites to each one of you individually. With that, here's me, Shomo Roy, signing off this edition of Building Together Special Webinars, wishing you a wonderful month ahead. Take care, stay well, and stay connected with Philips Lighting Academy till we meet again.